Hello, everyone. Welcome to MHTV. Really pleased to see you with us tonight. We've got a fantastic lineup of guests for you. And we're going to be talking about the medicalization of social issues, which is something I think that is coming across a lot of our workload plates at the minute. So I think it'll be something that will be really useful to hear what you have to think about as well. So just so that you can get involved as well and share your thoughts with us, because that's what we really, really like to hear from you. Um, let me hand over to Vanessa for a second and her, she can tell you how you can join in with us tonight. Yeah. Thanks, Nikki. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. You can um, join in one of two ways. If you're on Twitter, just follow the hashtag MHTV and um, tweet should pop up there and um, I'll be keeping an eye on that. So if you've got any questions for the panel tonight, then ask the questions there and we'll feed them into the discussion. If you're on Facebook, you just need to like the Unite MHA page and you can follow the live stream there. And again, ask questions in the comments box. If you've joined us before, you'll know that we like things to be interactive. So, you know, do ask questions and put your comments out there for us. Brilliant. And well, I'll let's hand go. you back over to Nikki. Let's go to our guests now so they can introduce themselves. Liam, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. Good evening. Um, my name's Liam Stowell. I'm a mental health nurse. Um, I've worked in CAM service now for the past 11 years, across the whole spectrum of them, from inpatient to community, and now in crisis team. Um, so yes, I work in CAM's crisis team, and I'm a manager there. Fantastic. And Anthony? Okay, so hi, everyone. My name's Anthony Molyneux. I'm a consultant child and adolescent psychiatrist. Um, I've worked in uh, well, I've been a medic since 2009, worked in psychiatry, uh, all branches of since 2011, and CAMS specifically uh, since 2014, consultant since uh, 20, 2018, uh, and I work in uh, local community CAMS service, as I say, as a consultant. But thank you both to our guests tonight, because I appreciate after a busy day actually spending more time talking about this may not be your first choice of evening activity, so I appreciate that. But I guess what's really important is for us to get started, maybe thinking about what we actually mean by medicalization of social issues. So I wonder if you could both um, let me know your thoughts on that. What is the medicalization of social issues? What we're we talking about? Okay, who wants to go first? Liam, do you want to or do you want me to? Go on, Anthony. Okay, so I mean, yeah, medicalization of social issues. So I guess um, in a nutshell, it's the, it, it, I would describe it as, this um, sort of creeping tendency over time for um, an, in, an increase in the tendency to view what were previously considered social problems as um, as as the remit and and the business of um, mental health care specifically. So I think this is I think this has come about. Um, my my sense is it's happened a lot since the since the start of the austerity years, mm. uh, with the with the onset of the Cameron government, mm. um, and I guess a, a strand of it that often sort of occurs to me is it when we when we think about we often hear don't we about uh, that we we're facing as a society we're facing a mental health epidemic, we often hear that and lots of we hear lots of noises out of government and the media. About how we need to ha we, how we need to tackle the mental health epidemic, and we have the great and the good come out. You know, we have, uh, you know, um, what's his face, uh, Prince William, and uh, and his wife come out as great advocates for for mental health, and we must do something about mental health. And for me, it encapsulates the tendency to focus entirely on the overt symptoms of a problem rather than looking at the causes. And and to me, that's that's contrary to the entire approach of Medicine, actually, uh, uh, throughout medical training, um, traditionally, the, the the scientific emphasis was and is and as it should be to focus on what the cause is and treat the cause. Obviously, there can be symptom amelioration, things like that alongside of that. Mm -hmm. But you have to treat the cause. But this focus on uh, the problems of society and conceptualizing them as, as mental health problems, to me, uh, ignores the obvious cause of of all of this which is when you when you drill down i mean it's not easy it's not, it's not easy it's not it's not difficult to see what the what the issues are that lead to lead people to have mental health crises in in greater and greater numbers as a society 
uh, goes through a program of austerity and cuts and privatisation and all the rest of it. We've had more and more family breakdowns as 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 uh, as uh, you know the economy has become more insecure and and there's been less and less of a social safety net. There'll be more family breakdowns, more um, emotional crises on top of that. Um, you know. Every single index of, of social um, of, of of you know social performance as a society, every single every single sort of indicator, whether it's crime or or you know or poverty or whatever else, or, or alcoholism or obesity or whatever, uh, as, or mental health problem has gone up and up and up. And this is a this is a consequence of this is a consequence of uh, quite obviously, to my mind anyway. Uh, it's quite obviously a consequence of, of the what's happened over that that period of the last sort of 10 12 years that the the systematic transfer of wealth from from uh, the ordinary working class people in the broader sense the 99 percent to the one percent and to the even to, to the point not one percent mm. if you do that you're going to get you're going to get mental health crises resulting from that mm. but to focus just on the mental health crises is to my mind, is just focused on the symptoms. And I do wonder whether it's in the government's and the powers that be's interest to focus to focus just on those mm-hmm. mental health symptoms as a as a way of avoiding having to deal with problems like poor housing, mm-hmm. like food banks, mm-hmm. like poverty generally, um, like the like the the dire quality of our education system and the worsening quality of our education system. And yeah, in, in a, so in a nutshell, I guess, um, looking at, from, to my mind, I do wonder whether conceptualising the problems of society as a mental health epidemic is a good way for the powers that be to avoid, or a convenient way for the powers that be to avoid looking at the obvious social problems and then they mm. can avoid having to do anything about those social problems. Mm. Mm. I wouldn't agree with any of that, I've got to say. <laughs> Liam, what do you do? you have anything you want to add to that? Or? Yeah, I, I think it sort of, Sort of continues what Anthony was saying that mm. I think there's been an obsession for a long period of time, especially in sort of Western cultures, to categorise things, mm. and and obviously there's been a need for that, in particular for sort of last hundred of years, and especially human things as well. So as things have become more medicalised in general, and there's been that push towards everything, I think it's been inevitable that that's gone on to human behaviour and emotion as well. I think in particular, probably since, the, you know, the 1940s sort of onwards, I think in particular sort of Nazi Germany were obsessed with categorising people and things and putting things into there. And I think it sort of continued as a result. And, and I think obviously the DSM, which was obviously initially in the early 60s, was, was, was a part of that. And I think, you know, the idea behind it was to try and give some gravitas and scientific underpinning to to mental health services because it was sort of seen as a bit of this sort of wacky thing from Freud of psychoanalysts and you know this thing to do with everyone is obsessed with having sex with the mother and things like that so I think they, they wanted to move away from this asylum type idea of mental health services but unbeknown to them I think it took on a power of itself which meant everyone could almost see themselves as having some form of mental health difficulty. Mm. I think mental health has almost become almost like a, a capital mental health because everyone, like mental health is this abstract thing, but it's almost become a, a tangible thing, something that almost is seen as physiological, mm. despite there being very little evidence to suggest that there is. Mm. So we're sort of caught in this in-between limbo land of... It's, we've gone so far down this medical route of all mm. understandings of human emotion. Mm. We almost can't get away with it or mm. away from it anymore. And I think that's some of the difficulties where, mm. so for example, someone might say, I suffer from anxiety rather than I am anxious. Mm. So, so anxiety becomes this almost separate entity in itself mm. where it almost has this power over a human being mm. rather than actually empowering them to say well actually you feel anxious about this so Mm. you know it's not about everything it could Mm. be about many many things Mm. so it it gives it a power within itself and whether that's a 
a conscious thing they've done or it's just an accidental thing, mm. I suppose for me is irrelevant because that's what it seems to be. Mm. Um, so yeah, I think that for me is probably what yeah. I mean. You're talking about a couple of different things, aren't you? So I think maybe, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I might have heard it wrong, but the things I was sort of picking up was Anthony was talking a bit about kind of societal problems being laid at the door of the individual a little bit. So this idea that if you are in poor housing, if you have uncertain finances, if those things cause you distress to the point where you can't continue, which is absolutely reasonable, then it's not your fault for not being resilient. Or for if you'd have gone for you know if you'd done some mindfulness you'd have been all right. That's not that's not reasonable yeah. expectation. And I think maybe I think, what you're talking about is language, which is yeah. weird as well. The, I mean, I I've heard that, students say stuff like, oh, "I'm a bit bipolar today." I'm like, mm. yeah, yeah, you're not. <laughs> that's yeah, yeah. not what that means. And I think that's part of the problem, isn't it? it it's it senses the difficulty purely within yourself. Yeah, yeah. and and then sometimes it can, it can be difficult to to look around you. Or, or to sort of see yourself as part of that wider system and wider society. Mm. And that's what we have to contend with in mental health services, that, because that becomes really difficult, because the emphasis in every single therapy, almost, other than mm. maybe things like systemic fam family therapy or open dialogue, which is few and far between in services, mm. Is it's on you, isn't it? Whether that's CBT, whether that's mm. DBT, whether you take medication, it's all about the emphasis on you. And if you're not getting better, mm. it's almost your fault. Mm. And whether mm. that's someone says that explicitly or not, I, I can imagine that's how people feel. Mm. If I don't feel better with this, what's mm. called an evidence-based approach, then there must be something really wrong with me. Mm. And I think that's where mm. I find difficulty with it. Because mm. actually think to get better maybe like what Anthony was alluding to maybe get, you know housing or getting a job and it's, it's not as simple as just that one thing so mm -hmm. one of the first times I go into trouble on social media was to say something like um you know if someone's experiencing domestic violence at home no amount of Prozac is going to change that exactly you have yeah. to that's not a medical problem it's a social problem that's not being managed mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and uh, there's a police issue you know it's there's there's lots yeah. of other things that need to be going on sometimes that end up sort of like washing back because they make you feel bad and if un, unsupported they will they will make you be ill there's mm -hmm. you know like being hungry being afraid those things will end up making you ill if if they're not stopped yeah. but because there's so few barriers stopping those things now it's almost like everything is getting swept into medicalization when it's actually other stuff well, it's like it's like um the only, the only sort of thing that's being offered as a solution is to is to see it all as a mental health problem, and it's kind of yeah. like, oh, so you're feeling, so people are hungry, people are exhausted, people are burned out, people are emotionally distraught because of all of the, mm. all of the horrible things that are happening to them in their lives as the as the society and the economy goes down and down and down so that inevitably will happen on a population level people are feeling distressed because of that mm. and it's like the almost the only solution is sort of that's offered this so, well go to your gp go to your gp so it's medicalized straight away and gp and gps are increasingly because they've faced huge cuts and everything else and mm -hmm. and um really intrusive and um disruptive managerialization of, of what they do and mm. take and taking away of their autonomy by mm. by the by the managerialization of the of the health service and everything else, and this imposition of, as Liam alluded to, evidence based guidelines and that which which take away clinician autonomy and say mm. no, this is what this is what you have to do because this is this is what the the evidence says. So GPs are able are increasingly all they're able to sort of turn around. It's not it's not all they're able to turn around and do, but you know increasingly what the what the, the what the only main one of the only main solutions that they're able to sort of turn to is to sort of say, well, maybe you know, maybe you're clinically depressed, and maybe you need to we need to start mm. antidepressant. And that's not that's not to say that that might not be. That's not yeah. that's not to say that that won't necessarily be even somewhat or even slightly helpful. Mm. But it's just, but it it feeds into the the whole thing feeds into and reinforces this idea that, as a, as I said at the outset the only thing that we can look at is the symptoms is the outward manifestation mm. of people's distress we like mm. do not look at the cause mm. 
Mm. You know, do not even yeah. think about what the cause might be. Mm. Mm. Seems to be the message, the implicit message of the whole thing. I yeah. suppose it's, as well, it's coming in at the same time as we're becoming more public mental health literate. You know, even things like, you know, the design and uh, management of cities and things like that. We know that there are ways that you can make people feel better in that environment and mm. ways that you can make them feel alienated and lonely and afraid. Yeah. And that one is one is better than the other. And more importantly, one turns out to be cheaper than the other. So <laughs> you can do like get a few flower beds in there and think about connectivity at the start. There's there's mm. there's that kind of like increasing literacy around talking mm. about mental mental health and mental well-being, which is not in itself a bad thing, is it? To have conversations we never had before. But there is again that thing that you know, for almost what Liam was saying about that somehow having access to medical jargon, because it's not a diagnosis, is it? If you made it up yourself. It's just jargon. <laughs> like, you know, just, and it, but it gives kind of like a validation or a power to the way that you feel. And I say I'm oh, anxious or depressed or whatever. And I think that language that. in mental health is is mm. really powerful. And mm. this these words that people who've been under mental health services they suddenly start using and they, they've never used them before. So for example, um on a ward, the, the famous thing is how are they present in settled and settled no, no one Who's, who's never been on mental health services has ever said how are you feeling today and they've gone i'm settled that that's how you de- yeah <laughs> that's how you describe a pond isn't it no one's ever yeah. said that but suddenly that becomes part of your world so you suddenly believe that i'm unsettled mm-hmm. and it's the same with um like when when uh, whether it's a young person for example and i remember this vividly when i first started in inpatient service said oh i think they're getting attached to you and, and it's, it's almost deemed as a suspicion is a bad thing. And, and, and I thought, well, surely that's that's a good thing. That's what we want, isn't it? Surely we want them to like us. <laughs> and I thought, well, why is that being viewed with suspicion? And I think we, we as men's health system, I'm saying whether this has been an accidental thing or not, there's this almost underlying, say, suspicion about what we do when we do it well, if it's not attached to something that's called an evidence base mm. like how dare you just maybe have a pleasant conversation with somebody mm. if it's not if it's not under an umbrella of some yeah it always has to be a three-word um mm. abbreviation to give it legitimacy in mental health services doesn't it, yeah. it does. where's the night where's the nice guideline to support that you know mm. that's the, that's the, that's almost the the implicit and explicit message of the system isn't it like mm. you know and you'll and you'll often hear like I've I've sort of had the experience, as I'm sure you have, Liam, and I'm sure we all have, where you know you you see you see a patient over a period of time, and you really just have a chat with them, mm. and they get and they get better, mm. somewhat. Mm. Uh, oftentimes they even get a lot better. But but the the message from management says, well, what are you what are you doing? What mm. what therapy are you doing? What can you what where's the evidence where's the evidence base for this? And it's almost like you have to. It's almost like to practice in mental health, it feels like you have to kind of, um, you have to kind of evidence that what you're doing is in accordance with the nice guideline on it uh, at the, on one level, but on another, le- on another level, do what actually works. Mm. I'm not, and I'm not saying that we don't do what the nice guidelines say, but it's almost like as though it's, it's, um, it's, it's, yeah, it's, Ticking, it's ticking box. It's ticking boxes, isn't it? On one level, and on the other level, actually doing the job. But the system, mm. as it's construed and as it's designed politically and managerially, the the system is, I'm sure, is absolutely sincerely con- convinced from the top that it's the box ticking that works. Yeah. That that people get better because we've done mm. session one of CBT, in which, according to the manual, we do this, and session two, according to the manual, we do this. But of course, people people get the life experience in mental health tells us that people improve due to a, a human a human interaction a human human relationship with where the where the concerns are validated and you can just have that connection but that's because it's because it's in the process mm. of a human interaction that's hard to document and hard to mm. evidence mm. Um, and hard to box tick and so there's not mm. there's there's precious little sort of system recognition that that's what that's what actually does seem to make people better or that 10 you know. sessions or your money back kind of desire for it to work yeah because it's something you can measure so it doesn't really matter whether it yeah. works it matters whether you can measure it and then you reverse engineer that it worked but actually yeah. often if you just get out of somebody's way 
and put them somewhere where they're safe and connected mm-hmm. and cared about, they'll often recover by themselves. I know I'm making human uh, beings sound a bit like house plants, but well, no, but, it's, but it's but it's nature. It's nature, mm-hmm. isn't it? I mean, people, people, human beings are social animals, mm-hmm. and if they have, if they have, you know, a secure, if they have a secure, what's a good, a secure base. Mm. Um, positive social interactions with the people around them, know that they're cared for, know that they don't have any exist any significant existential worries and they can just mm. go about the business and you know um and and tend to themselves and, and have and have that social interaction. They'll they'll do all right. Mm. Um but there's as I say there's, there seems to be precious little um precious little sort of understanding of that from the kind of political managerial system. I mean there's a great quote by um you, I mean, you asked it, you asked the outset, didn't you? Just mm-hmm. about uh, what you know, sort of uh, little snippets that that might sort of mm-hmm. might sort of uh, you know um, uh, land quite well with the audience, sort of thing. But one thing, I, I mean, I'm sure you've heard it yourself. But there's that great quote, I think, from Einstein. He says, "Not not everything that counts is countable, and not everything that is countable counts." And it just it just gets across that uh, to me. It just mm-hmm. it just gets across that di- that disjunct between the sort of political managerial understanding of of what works in mental health as opposed to the kind of clinician understanding mm, of what works yeah. in mental health i mean there's this there's this sort of desperate desire from the top to my mind for quantification of you know of of you know you've got it you've got to get some data in any kind of data mm. even if it's yeah, any kind of data even if it's meaningless mm. is better than something that's di- uh, difficult by its very nature to measure. But actually, as it turns out, in my opinion, and I'm sure the opinion of others, as it turns out, it's the it's it's that stuff that you can't measure that makes people feel better. It's the therapeutic relationship. Mm, absolutely. So you're saying like that this has been on a trajectory for a while now. I wonder what the um, impact of so the last couple of years of like COVID times has been having, particularly because you're both working in, in the field for young for young people who are particularly, I think, vulnerable to this experience it was a really unusual thing that happened and Mm. i don't know if it was the same for anthony but the first six months almost nothing happened Mm. it it, if anything it it went the other way and i mean that could be for a, a number of reasons um but since then yeah it's uh it's probably surpassed all years and then somewhat. So, mm. for example, where I work, we've had almost month on month 100% increase in referrals in comparison to pre-pandemic. And so mm. that's a significant strain upon the service, and mm. which I don't, I don't think anyone could have predicted. But it was it was already problematic, problematic to find a bed near your house before. COVID. Yeah, yeah, especially in children's services. I think mm. I think there's there's been a reduction in in beds. And I think but once again, I don't think that was necessarily mm. a bad thing to, yeah. to not have children locked up in inpatient units. Yeah. But that would need to be done with an entire system being able to support that. Mm. Um, and I think that's where we sort of have some of the, the deficits where you know education is still drastically ill equipped. You've got CAM services, which often off, offer very different services depending on where you live. And I think that navigation of the system is very complicated. Mm. And I think with that causes lots of anxieties for parents and young people of where to go. And something that Anthony mentioned before, of like, it's almost the one-stop shop. If, if you've got something wrong with you, you go to your GP. So they're understandably inundated, so they will just refer on. Mm. And so everything comes under the health umbrella because where else do you go? A and E is always open no matter what. So you'll mm. go there, won't you? Your, your social services aren't open all the time. Mm. Your schools aren't open all the time. Mm. So you're almost left with nowhere to go. And I think that's, that's we've almost been... Um, a product of our own sort of maybe success as well of thinking, well, we're able to support because we're here. So mm. people come to us because there is still at least a human being that you can talk to. Mm. Granted that that's in Christ. And I think, you know, that's a, a bit of a double-edged sword, really. Mm. 
I mean, that makes a lot of sense, actually. I hadn't really considered it that way. But I suppose if you've got an accessible, friendly um, experience, then you're just going to keep doing it, aren't you? You're not going to like pop down to the police station, see how that works for you. It's not going to work that way. So it makes sense, doesn't it, when you actually put it that way? What do you, mm. what's, what's your opinion, Anthony, particularly around um, the kind of impact of COVID? Yeah, I mean, my my experience, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, sort of um, uh, re- reflects reflects Liam's. Really, we, I mean, we found that during those first months, you remember that that long spring. I mean, you know, the the March and into the April was was horrendous, horrendously fearful for everyone, wasn't it? And yeah. that, you know, as that you remember that the, the sort of the number of deaths was kind of sort of exponentially growing. And um, and I remember looking around the looking around the team on the on the the Microsoft Teams meetings. Mm-hmm. Other other packages are available, I should say, to have a But um but yeah, looking around looking around my colleagues and the, you could see that the literal uh, yeah. fear in people's yeah. eyes of like it was it, everyone thought this was going to be they might end up might end up dead you know for, and then and then it kind of moved into that sort of period late april through the through may and into the, into the summer and we had that lovely long spring oh, lovely <laughs> beautiful, beautiful weather and uh the, they had the furlough program and everything else and yeah it was the things went quite quiet and i think children and young people saw it as a reprieve from yeah. school and yeah. it's almost like it's almost a kind of cliche in cams that um you know, as a junior doctor on a on a on a psychiatry rotation, so you you we you know as you, as you may know, we doctors move jobs uh, at the beginning of August, and it's always kind of known that when you're moving into a CAMS job, it's kind of like as a as a as a junior doctor, it's like oh, August August is always fine, you know, because uh, and well, I wonder why that might be, you know, young people are out of school, um, and then and then you get into and normal course of things, you get into September October, and it becomes busier and busier. Mm-hmm. Um, what we what we found, and it pro- I'm sure it probably paralleled other other sort of clinicians' experiences, was that you had you had that real lull uh, in over the summer, and then the August, uh, unlike other August, unlike kind of usual experience in August, August seemed to start getting busy, and it was the sense was that it was as young people were started, they'd had this three, four, five month break from school. Yeah. And then they saw school sort of on the horizon and the, the anxiety sort of started to crop up again, which again should, um, all of what I'm saying, I think should, should, I mean, should it not make us reflect as a society on the quality of our state education system? Yeah. Um, school, okay. we've had, you know, we've had over over the past sort of uh, 10 plus years, going back into the new labor era, even, I think, I think it was Tony Blair actually started. We've had the academization of schools, the merger of schools, schools have become, state secondary schools have become big places, you know, big, big almost factory-like institutions. And I think for a bigger and big, for a larger, larger number of young people, it's become, um, it's, it's become, the reality is it's become quite an unpleasant experience. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I don't, I think there's precious little sort of reflection on, um just just the quality just the quality of um experience of of, of, of young working mm-hmm. and middle class people who have to go to who have to go to state secondary school because because they they, they can't afford, the parents can't afford to go to a, a private school uh and um i think i'm not saying all state schools are, are, are awful but I think across the board, I just think across the board, our, our education system could be so much better. But again, there's precious little reflection on this because yeah. we because we're encouraged to look at things as mental health symptoms. We, you know, the as I said, yeah. traditionally, tradi- traditionally in August it was a quiet time. Then September and October we get busier, and again, and we just look at it as like, oh well, it's a you know mental health crises again, rather than thinking what's causing this. Well, the obvious thing that's causing it is that loads and loads of people are anxious about the experience of school. Well, why aren't we yeah. doing something about, about that as a society? Mm. I think, you know. And, and I think that was reflected, especially as well with um, children in the care system as well. So yeah. we've had a, a significant increase of presenting it in very high risk situations. And it, it's unbeknown to anything I've, I've sort of seen before. And I think there's some external things that, I wasn't aware of so up until 
September 2021. Um, children could be placed in unregulated placements at all ages. And I know that's only over the age of 16. I think maybe naively, I just presumed all would be regulated because it's children in the care system. Yeah. So this was an absolute shock to me that for, for years we've had children just think placements that have, have never been inspected. And it, it was quite a shocking thing. And mm. and I, I think during the pandemic, there was something like something between 200 and 300 brand new care homes got opened that hadn't been checked by Ofsted, which for me was a bit of a shocking statistic that suddenly, as if it was known, that lots of children would end up in the care system. The orders popped up everywhere, which to me was was a bit of a shock, really. Mm. And I think that has has continued, and it, and it probably came to a bit of a a bit of a boiling point because you know, children in the care system, lots of in residential setting, not allowed to go out, not allowed to see people, not allowed to to go anywhere, must have been absolutely horrendously difficult. Mm. And as well, like Anthony saying, with with members of staff who they were once again probably quite scared themselves and mm. were, were in the and suddenly whether they probably had to be masked up and things like that so that with children with relational difficulties because they may have been moved from place to place and they've experienced trauma and things yeah suddenly faced with literally faceless members of staff mm. must have been really challenging for them and I don't think we've quite grasped that or reflected mm. upon that enough probably mm. because we're still in it Mm. I don't know how we're going to get out of it to almost look back and think, you know, this is a pretty awful time to be. Mm. I think it, COVID really showed the, the sort of um, fractures in our society and they really, it did show up who, because it, it was, it was not equally spread the weight on people so obviously. And the people who struggled were the people who were the most marginalised, the most vulnerable, the poorest, and it, it was so obvious. Not even then you add in sort of race and cultural issues as well on top of that. And all of a sudden you've got a real picture of what's wrong. I suppose the question is, are we going to get our breath back enough to figure out how to put it right? Um, I've noticed, so I, I've appreciated you being sat there. I wondered if you wanted to come in. I've got a couple of questions from students coming through, but um, I wondered if you wanted to chip in before I went to them. Yeah, um, no, I mean, I've been listening and agreeing really with everything that's said. And I have to say, as both a parent and a mental health nurse, particularly, you know, the comments on, on schools. Um, and I think reflects the whole conversation really about we take this sort of interventionist approach to people in primary care and across the system. We don't look at the whole picture. So someone who's representing it in primary care over and over again, not like stopping to think, well, why do they keep representing? What's the bigger picture? What's going on at home? And I think the thing with school reflects that as well, doesn't it? Because instead of, you know, the number of children who are um, emotionally avoiding school at the moment, which is the sort of latest thing, isn't it? Instead of actually thinking about kind of how we can look at that in a holistic way involving schools, it's seen as something pathological um, and schools then aren't equipped to kind of deal with it when actually there's a lot that schools could do to help that situation rather than seeing it as a CAMS issue. So that was kind of what was going through and I, my And head. I think that's key because like within the system, they're known as school avoiders rather than what you said of avoiding school. So once yeah. that language of like, this is who you are. So well, yeah. well, no, you're just not going to school. Like it's not, it's not part of your personality that it's a pathological yeah. thing. of like, like yeah. it's a school avoidance disorder. Yeah. I think there was, there was a key change in the education system where so historically schools would put people through for special educational needs statements and things because we got additional funding for it. Although that, right. even though that funding wasn't ring fenced to use yeah. for that special educational need, they could use it to, to paint the PE cupboard or whatever it was. Mm. So, so obviously then people got wind of that. So then they just got a set budget for the year to, to do everything. Mm. Mm. And then now to get additional things, they have to pay out of that budget to do things like educational health care plans and get psych educational psychology in. So there was a shift there, which understandably then schools are reluctant to put in additional support because you know it costs them rather than them getting extra money, which seems yeah. a very bizarre way to go about things. 
Mm. Yeah, I think so. And and it's similar to what we said, though, about the therapeutic relationship. It's the same with teaching. Um, you know, a good teacher can make a massive difference to a child. And, you know, you remember your good teachers for the rest of your life, don't you? I mean, I can certainly remember back to my childhood and good and bad teachers. And sometimes it's the same in mental health, isn't it? That just practical things that they could do in schools around um you know, for example, this example, really getting a child back to school, really practical things that they could do, um, which kind of people don't think about because everyone is thinking about complex evidence based interventions, as we said in the first place. Whereas it could be, you know, a child that I don't know, for example, a child that's introverted going back to school with all the noise and the big classrooms in state schools and all the rest of it, kind of looking at ways of, of, of helping a child adapt rather than thinking this is um, a sort of mental health issue or a neuro, yeah. neurodiversity issue. Yeah, and it and it prompts um, it prompts um, a, a, a sort of lack of self-confidence on the part of education professionals, doesn't it? Because yeah. if we yeah. if we have this if we have this understanding of things as Oh, this is an, a mental a mental health problem or an, an emotional well being problem. You know, you, the the immediate and understandable reaction of people who aren't trained in mental health is to go, "Well, I'm not yeah. trained in mental health, so I don't, yeah, totally. so I don't know how to, I don't know how to how to manage this here." And it's like, well, actually, if we just if we just stripped away this kind of over medicalized mm-hmm. yeah. understanding and in inverted commas of, of the problem and just and, and just kind of, you know looked at it in, in the old fashioned way of common sense, then people would fall back on their yeah. own commonsensical human resources mm-hmm. and know and know straight away what to do just because just because they're, they're human beings. So I think it's I think although no doubt it's well intentioned, uh, mm-hmm. this med this medicalized uh, view of view of things, um I think I do wonder whether to a large extent it, it can end up disempowering people who would otherwise do uh, a really yeah. good job falling back on their own resources and their own skills and their own right. knowledge. Yeah. The interesting is about power to name things as well. So children get called school avoiders for avoiding school. Well, I've been all my career around work avoiders who've never been named anything. <laughs> like, quite, a, quite an extraordinary thing. Um, I've mm. got a couple of questions. I have to telescope yeah. them. So thank you for um, students who've, who've, who've uh, texted in. There's quite a few people wanting to know how to work in cams, which is quite nice for you guys oh, to see good. that. Yeah, about three people were asking, how do I get into cams? And I think they mean professionally, so excellent. <laughs> That'd be handy, <laughs> wouldn't it? Um, mm. And someone, I've got a great question here. Is bullying a mental health issue? Oh, that's somebody, I think what they mean is if somebody's a bully, are they mentally unwell? Oh. Well, I think that's interesting oh. in itself, isn't it? I've, yeah. Yeah. Mm. I think for me, it's an understanding of like, we have this very strange dichotomy in mental health where it's, is it mental health or is it behaviour? And I still have no idea what that means, even though it comes up on almost every meeting that I ever go to. (laughs) Because I think, well, everything's a behaviour. If I'm hungry, I go to the fridge and see what's in there. That is a behaviour as a result of that. And I suppose, so it's it's the same as everything, is it? you do something as to convey something that you're feeling i think sometimes like if it's difficult to go to someone actually your behavior is an accumulation of almost an infinite interactions that you've had since pre-birth and also to do with the society around you and that's happened over the past you know so many millions of years it's a big concept to deal with when you're talking to a 12 year old child in the clinic i feel like you could do with some simplification yeah so <laughs> sometimes, sometimes goes, you simplify really. it down don't we and, mm. so, and i understand that but, but that is the reality isn't it but i think sometimes actually we have those conversations and even with a 12 year old they tend to get it and i think sometimes we're afraid of having these big ideas with, with children almost with each other mm. is almost a bit of anti-intellectualism within society mm. yeah. where actually if we, we have these conversations and, and i've had them it's very rare that they get shot down people tend mm. to go oh, that makes sense actually something that's yeah. happened in my life has resulted in me behaving in this way mm. it's like that occam's razor thing isn't it actually that makes sense to people rather than mm. this unknown brain disorder thing that you mm. may have going on mm. i suppose it's the same with the bully often mm. it's around like i say conveying something that's happened it may be around control it, mm. it may be none of the above but you tend to as human beings and as we've all we we replicate our environment don't we so there'll be something in that child's environment which is around 
aggression around violence or lack yeah. of control would be my guess. Mm. Um, it it may be one of the above, but mm. I, I have to say I've never known it not to be. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and I guess that is, if this, is it normal as well? The, the big N word, is it normal or are they sick? What's going mm. on? And I think that, that that's always such a complicated issue, isn't it? And I always find it very insulting to people with mental health issues when bad behaviour is, is yeah. linked with being mentally unwell. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So somebody's, I don't know, a rapist or a murderer or something like that, is it because they're mentally ill? It's like, well, they may be mentally ill as well, but that's not what causes that behaviour necessarily. Mm. There's a there's a big difference, isn't there, between someone who's depressed or has dementia and somebody who has purposefully harmed somebody else. And those mm. two things aren't necessarily linked like the way that the press would have you believe as well, I think. So yeah. this, who, who gets to be who gets to be normal? Do we get to forgive people? And there's that all tied up in it. Sorry, Andy, you were going to say something. Yeah, I, in these sorts of questions, I, I I tend to find it's quite helpful to think of it in terms of like, well, it's often not an either or, but a but a both, not an either or, but a both and. It's kind of, so. I tend to sort of think of things like that as being well. On the one level, you look at something. Uh, scientifically as an explanation of what's gone on but that's a different question from a moral question yeah. so there might well there might well and invariably is as, as Liam as, as Liam has alluded to already a scientific explanation of why a bully is bullying um mm. you know but that but just because there's a scientific explanation if you go back and you know it's usually the sort of thing like of like hurt people hurt people you know that there's been something in that person's past that that they're kind of they're wanting to compensate for in terms of control and, and that sort of thing. Invariably, not absolutely always, but invariably it tends to be the case. But that I, I tend to find it helps to to think of that as a different question from uh moral moral judgment and moral sanction. And just because there might be a scientific and usually there's a scientific explanation for why somebody is doing is bullying doesn't make it okay and doesn't mean that it shouldn't be sanctioned. Absolutely. Put another question coming from Alfonso. Hello, Alfonso. Uh, I know this is a complex question, but I was wondering if the panel had any advice on how to support young LGBT plus people, particularly around young trans people. I mean, for me, it, it's just almost the same as supporting anybody. It's, it's, it's almost down to that. It's down to that individual, isn't it? I think sometimes we can almost get lost in. Once again, it's almost over, an oversimplification of someone. Well, actually, the most important thing about you is that you are labelled as LBGT plus or trans. It's it's not, isn't it, at all? It, it's around what's happened to you as an as an individual. That's just part of your understanding, part of your culture, part of your identity. It, it's not everything about you, is it? No, uh, and I, I think, think sometimes we can get mm -hmm. lost in that yeah. um, within services, and I think. It's the same whether it's like saying someone's got a diagnosis of ADHD or ASD. I think mm. sometimes we can fall into this categorization and, and almost that in, in itself becomes medicalized. Yeah. Um, I don't know what you think, Antonio. Yeah, I think I think as well. Um sorry, sorry, did you wanna sorry, Vanessa, did you wanna um, oh, yeah, I was just go on then. I was just gonna add really that it's this is a whole assumption as well that transgender issue is a mental health issue and fits within the mental health system, whereas there might be some mental health issues arriving arising from somebody um being transgender, but it's not necessarily a mental health issue, but we always fit it within the mental health system. Any discussions on transgender are instantly related to mental health, I think. I mean, it's obviously a bigger topic than what we've got time to discuss now, but um, I just wanted to make that point because um, it's something that I've observed quite a lot in recent months with discussions about transgender. I think it's the same with neurodiversity as well, actually. The neurodiversity is pigeonholed into mental health, and just because you're neurodiverse doesn't mean that you've got a mental health issue. Mm, absolutely. And and to, to pick up on on sort of both both of, the, both of the points that you made there, I mean, it's I think it, I think I wonder whether oftentimes it might come across as incredibly patronising, you know, to, to, for this this sort of assumption that all all LGBT plus people are are the same sort of sort of people yeah. in absolutely every way. I mean, it's uh, that that goes into what Liam was saying, doesn't it? I mean, every mm -hmm. everybody, whether LGBT plus or or non LGBT plus, are, are individuals with their own life stories and equally valid oh, yeah. life experiences and all the rest of it. And I think I wonder whether it's almost it, it can almost come across again through often often through 
being well intentioned, but I, mm. I wonder whether this sort of it can it can end up sort of pigeonholing people and actually mm. being actually coming across as quite patronising. It's, it's just something. That and, it's, and it seems like a throwback to almost the the fifties and sixties where homosexuality mm. was a mental illness, yeah. and yeah, there's such yeah. a, and there's such a fight with like the Stonewall movement and and, and the riots and and to, to get mm. it to get it voted out, to, and, and it's almost a power to say almost that was your choice. As, as part of your identity, as part of your culture, however you want to understand it. Whilst there seems to be a regression back to, it's not a choice, it's like what Vanessa said, actually, mm-hmm. it's a, it's some form of mental disorder that you yeah. are different to mm-hmm. uh, a heterosexual person, which, which seems bizarre, doesn't it? Like, it, yeah. it's just like, it's almost it's like there's some nice. genetic mutation. Like, and that's just, yeah. that to me seems really wrong. Mm-hmm. So, I think the thing is, I mean, I can't even remember being young. So apologies, young people. Um, don't worry, it'll be over soon, and then you'll be old and you won't have to worry about it. But um, I think there's something really important about, about being seen, though, isn't there? Mm. You know, and if that's who, if that's that's your experience right now, and you see yourself as having that identity, it's really important for people to see you because I think both younger people and older people can be somewhat desexualized by society. Mm. If people don't want to get get into that. Which is, you know, personal choice. That's fine, <laughs> but, and and rightly, if a child is very young, please don't go down there. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, though, kind of, you know, you don't have to be having sex to have a sexual identity or to have yeah. um, some part of you that you want to talk about or understand better. Yeah. So I guess it's about not ignoring people, but also understanding that it's it's often the stigma and the the rudeness, the unkindness, the, like the thousand cut stuff that actually causes the mental distress got nothing to do with who you love or how you see yourself. It's to do with how other people fail you, yeah. particularly as a child, mm-hmm. in terms of understanding who you are as a person, I, w- I would think. Yeah, and I think Having never people... really enjoyed working in cams, hold my hands up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think young people are often marginalised, and like say over the past mm-hmm. couple of years, they've been utterly, well, almost everyone has, but especially children are completely dictated to about when they yeah. can go to school, when they can't go to school everything about their lives so you can understand why they'd want to try and grasp control wherever and think of other things whenever you think of things like anti-social behavior you may think of children you don't think of that that rugby team of just sunk 12 pints each when you get the backside out right, do you know what I, mean? yeah. do you know what I mean it's and it's the same way when it was asbos and all the rest of it it's always mm. children isn't it and i think there's this slightly snobbishness towards things that young people like like video games for example mm. so well this encourages violence, mm. not, not like the, the government's going to wars and things like that. No, it's yeah. definitely video games. Yeah. Um, as if violence is a new phenomena. Mm-hmm. And, and if you think of like, no one says that about Beethoven's Fifth, do they? Where the opening sort of symbolises the cannons going off, thinks, oh, well, when I listen to Beethoven, I fancy getting myself a cannon. I mean, it's just this snobbishness towards what young people like. And I just yeah. think it's just ridiculous. You need to really have your finger on the pulse, Liam, before young people like, what's like, what? Yeah, no. Probably all those are comments now saying, I love Beethoven's gift. Yeah, what's, wrong with yeah. <laughs> what's wrong with me having a cannon in an enclosed space? It's fine. Um, <laughs> a couple of people are joining in now. So Victoria is saying, educating topic. Thank you very much. Interesting question on bullying. Um, and then Chrissy Yates Blackburn has got something on. Sorry, another thing just came in there. Uh, mental health illness is a nebulous concept. I think we're all agreeing with that, yeah. Uh, I wondered if the panel had come across Drop the Disorder community and the MAD Insights, uh, based on the work of uh, Robert uh, Whitaker and ERNI, Emotions Are Not Illnesses Declaration, um, the position like-minded people accessing and working in services around the medicalization of the, the human experience. Yeah, no, Drop the Disorder is a, is a really good event. I know it's run by psychologist Lucy Johnston, who mm-hmm. is, is sort of a fantastic advocate of this. And I know there's an event coming up, actually. I don't want to promote it too much, but I think... It's already been it, linked to, don't worry. <laughs> yeah, so I think there's like Gabo Matai on it, and Dr. Mm-hmm. Sammy Tamimi and people like that. So I know, I know they these are really good speakers on... Probably, what, I'm going to say, actually, no, they're not much better than me and Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> nearly as good, nearly as good. <laughs> nearly as good. They're yeah. getting there with their own event. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he did try. Yeah. <laughs> uh, also about intersectionality, as Alfonso said. Yeah, minority stress factors added to the young label. So I guess there's lots of different things going on there. But there is kind of like a disregard, I think, towards young people and mm. what they like and what they're interested in. I guess we with there's one thing we wanted to sort of like focus on before we finish up because we are getting a bit over time. So what's wrong with how we measure success in services at the moment? So if you could change the one thing, what would you do? About how we sorry, Liam, you go. I was gonna. I just was gonna keep it really short. I would um, 
just scrap scrap them all. If, if, if I'm being honest, I think surely how we should measure success is down to that individual and whether they feel hmm. happier. To, to, to almost, yeah. I know I've sort of said don't oversimplify things, but realistically, it's down for them, isn't it? It's, not, it's almost not for us to dictate to another human being if you're better or not, or what mm-hmm. what, what better entails. Yeah. I think there's there's a bit of an arrogance about the system in, yeah. in which it dictates to people all the time and. I almost struggle with how can we have objective markers to do with very individualised, subjective experience. Like to sit in front of someone and it's happened before, like, how angry are you? And they'll go a nine. I think, you've just sat here for an hour and you've not tried to punch me once. So if that's your nine anger, I'm happy. <laughs> do you know what mm-hmm. I mean? I think I'm good with that. So I think it's a very bizarre concept that we have. Um, yeah, so that's what I'd do. So stop measuring. Stop measuring, <laughs> Anthony. I think that's I think that's a a, a generally good sort of um, strategy to take. Yeah, I mean the the what sort of exists across mental health services now is these routine outcome measures. Uh, uh, ROMs is the is the sort of abbreviation. And again, I'm not saying that the I'm not saying that the absolutely never any any use or, or useful or anything like that. I mean, uh, you know, in in sort of Targeted situations, they, they can be very useful, but there's, there does seem to be this blanket sort of uh, approach from from uh, from the government that they have to be applied right across services, and it just it it, uh, it just seems to me oftentimes that it's it goes back to the Einstein quote again. You know, not everything that counts is countable, not everything that is countable counts. It's just mm-hmm. it's it's getting. It seems to me to be getting data for the purpose of you know you know. On the assumption that if you get data, it doesn't really matter how meaningless it is. It, but it's data, and that's something that can be used to evidence something. And there's, I don't think there's, I don't think there's a lot of sort of thinking about or or reflection on um, nuances of the situation. Like if you, you know, if you if you're in a final session with a young person, you say, oh well, you know, how did you, how did you, how how do you feel now, you know, and they and they and they say, well, and they put on the ROM score that they feel better. I mean. It, is that necessarily a reflection that they do feel better? And what you, yeah. I'm sure, what you often see is that they're, they're wanting to, they're not wanting to let their therapist down. Yeah. They might well not feel better, but they don't want to. They don't want to come across like mm. you know. They want to. They want to people please because they want to. They don't want to get the therapist in trouble. And so it looks to the system like there's been yeah. an improvement, but there might well not have been. So this, mm. I, 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 mm. I wonder whether there's a, a great deal of reflection from the top about what we are actually measuring, and so. I wouldn't necessarily mm. disagree with with Liam's general um, conclusion of get rid, I tell get you, rid of I, it. I agree. There was a young person that me and Auntie once saw together, and I know how we measured it. In our final session, you could tell that they wanted to give us both a hug, um, but but they didn't. So, so so we measured that. I think that's a success because actually they wanted to give us a hug before they were done. Mm. So we thought, yeah, that's a, probably a good uh, good way to measure that one. But also, like what you've just said, it's about um, looking longer term, isn't it? So if somebody's only offered so many sessions and at the end they want to say, you know, they want to please you and say that that was satisfactory and they're feeling better, we need to know how they are in a year's time or two years' time. That's the real measure of success, isn't it? Mm. Because they might feel okay at that point in time, but is it going to have any longer term impact or is this person going to keep representing i don't think we look enough about at that really no, indeed yeah i mean there are i'm, I'm sure you could construe uh, ways of ways of measure of measuring outcomes that that are more meaningful and do capture um mm. real mm. Pro, real progress and real improvement and, and liam mentioned um earlier on uh, professor sammy tamimi who's who's uh, speaking at, i gather at that drop the disorder um event I, my, my understanding is that the Professor Tamimi has has come up with a, um, a, a, an outcome measure system, or ado- or or adopted an outcome measure system that does seem to be more um, more reflective and and representative of of you know of actual improvement than than some of the some of the ROM systems that are used. Mm-hmm. Is my understanding. Thanks. Mm. We'll have to come to a come to a stop here. I think we're just getting to a stage where. 
we had uh, some coffees, we'd all be stretching out and actually getting really stuck in. So we might come back to this, actually, at another point. But um, just to finish off, um, Gunnar Trump has written, um, the scale of, of acceptance of the injustice of medicalisation is truly astounding. And I think she's really put a finger on something there. Because we've been yeah. talking about this in quite a bloodless, kind of abstract kind of way. Mm -hmm. But at the moment, the need for services is absolutely ballooning. The number of staff is declining. <laughs> and mm -hmm. we've got to do something differently. You know, what, whatever we're doing at the moment isn't working I'd say brilliantly <laughs> we need to think about doing something differently so um, maybe this will be something we'll actually come back to and have a look at maybe looking at solutions because we've certainly got a lot more of an idea of, of the problems that are being caused yeah. at the moment and the problems that people are experiencing so thank you very much to our fantastic guests Liam and Anthony tonight really appreciated having you with us yeah, thank you both. Good to be here. thank you much. thank you guys um, and perhaps another time I think and good night, everybody. Thank you for joining us and thank you for getting involved and, and sharing your thoughts. Good night. Thank you. Good Bye. night, all. Bye, everyone.